House Rules Committee as members work on a legislative branch spending bill for fiscal year 1995. The Rules Committee decides the guidelines on how debate is conducted in the House. Legislative appropriation deals with money to be spent to run the House of Representatives, including members' expense accounts. The chair of the committee is Democrat Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here with an amendment off being offered in conjunction with my friend and colleague, Congressman Jack Quinn, who's scheduled, I noticed, to testify also to uh, the committee later. Very straightforward amendment, Mr. Chairman. We propose to cut $4 million from the franking allowance in uh, the FY95 budget. Uh, some history on this point in FY93. 47.7 million was authorized, uh, 24 million dollars expended. Uh, FY94, 40 million dollars authorized. I might note that that amount was reduced 12 percent on the House floor through an amendment that I offered, which trimmed 5.8 million dollars off uh, of that which came out of the committee. Of the uh, $40 million, it looks like funding will be in that vicinity uh, in the uh, FY94 year. I believe it's time to take another whack at the franc and propose a uh, uh, $4 million reduction, which would represent uh, a funding level of $31 million, a 25% decrease below that of uh, FY94. Uh, That's a tough reduction but I believe it is one within which the members can uh, uh, meet their responsibilities to keep their constituents informed. Uh, moreover, I think it signals very clearly to the public that in responsible ways, in ways without impairing the function of the legislative branch, Congress is prepared to step up to the plate and make tough cuts starting right in our own array of office allowances, specifically the Frank. So that concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Doesn't the uh the committee itself come in with a reduction in franking? They do indeed, and I think that a little more could be done, which is why it's uh, a, a further $4 million adjustment. We don't think that is uh, reckless, but it represents an additional trim with, uh, with which the, uh, the ledge branch could easily uh, survive. Mr. Goss? No, I, I thank you for the testimony. We've got a lot of testimony uh, in this area on cutting the on frank, frank, and I, I think it is very clear that there's uh, heat out there across America on the members uh, to deal with this, and I hope we're going to have a good amendment. Uh, your amendment is certainly a, a valuable contribution to what we've had so far. I would prefer to go a lot further, but uh, I uh, respect your right to, to draw the line at four, four million, and it's nowhere near enough. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. Thank you. Ooh. Thomas Ewing, I know you've been here a long time. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll take only a very few minutes uh, to discuss uh, two amendments that I uh, want to present. Let me give in the way a background that uh, Congress last year uh, passed a 4% reduction in the legislative branch employees' uh, appropriation. As part of that, as the way that was met, we cut out all the LBJ intern programs. I wonder if we really thought about that, if we realized that uh, this was the one program that allowed uh, students from minority students and poorer students to have an opportunity to work on the Hill. We all have interns that come and their families can afford for them to work for nothing in our offices and to live on the Hill. But this allowed students who didn't have that financial backing. So the two amendments that I present here today is one to fully restore the LBJ uh, intern program at 1,144,000 and to take an equivalent amount away from 
the uh, appropriation for investigative staff. And that is my proposal. Do you have another amendment, sir? No, the, well, one amendment is to uh, restore it, and the other one is to oh, I, reduce oh, it. Oh, it's the opposite. OK. Uh, Mr. Quillen, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that makes sense to me, because the LBJ vote is important. I think an equal cut should be made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss? I thank you for posed a very fair question to us of whether the LBJs are worth more than the committee investigative staff, and I know where my vote would come down. It's a good debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I uh, told people they could have less, uh, the LBJ scholarship in my office, and then when they were denied, I had, had to pay them out of some kind of a, a staff allowance to bring them down there, because, you know, once you tell them you're going to bring them down. But I agree with you. It's a, it's a very important project, and that just brings to mind what, what happens when people just cut without thinking a lot of things through. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I, 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 I agree with your concept. Well, I, I think we want to keep um, the option open for students from uh, less than wealthy families to have the experience working on the Hill. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Honorable Leslie Byrne of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment that I'm offering today will eliminate $7 million uh, in appropriation funds for the renovation of the U.S. Botanic Garden Conservatory. Uh, while the Botanic Gardens uh, serves a very important function for education in our nation's capital, we have to look at money expended for the best purpose. Uh, I will enter the rest of my testimony uh, into the record, but in a nutshell, in 1990, the architect of the Capitol asked for $21 million total to build the conservatory. Uh, this is the first year we've put money into that program, $7 million. The unfortunate thing is that there is no final design, there is no uh, thing that we can look at to say if that's money well spent or not. It seems to me that this money doesn't need to be uh, appropriated in this budget without seeing what we're buying. And so this amendment is pretty straightforward. It holds the money out of $7 million for this conservatory until we're going to get a design and see what we're buying. Uh, <clears throat> have you talked with the architect's office? On this matter? The Appropriations Committee has talked with the architect's office, and this is the second year they said the architect's office has indicated that de the design will be there. Uh, it has yet to materialize. Um, the costs have also risen uh, in the estimation of the architect from 21 now to 28 million without a design in place. Uh, I think what we're looking here to do is, rather than just throw money at something we don't know what it looks like yet, is to get the attention of the architect to say, look, if you want to go forward with this new conservatory, uh, why don't we get a design on the table? I uh, think some other members have gotten the attention of the architect through other means. Yes, yes. Well, this, this, is, uh, this is a fairly uh, common sense approach in when we're looking at tight dollars. Uh, building a new conservatory that we don't even have a design for mean, yet. You mean they'd rip the present one down and build another one? Is that what you're saying? Well, this is to replace the, the old botanical gardens. Right, the, the conservatory, oh. not not the gardens themselves. Oh. This is a this is a new building. Oh, all right, okay, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It looks like we're buying a pig in the pole. Is that all right? I think that about nails well, it. Thank you. <laughs> I congratulate you. Well put, well handled, and with good appearance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate the lady for treading where sacred cows fear to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I agree with your observation that we ought to know what we're doing before we start spending the public's money. I think that the Botanical Garden is a wonderful, valuable asset to our country, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, many visitors have. It's being renovated, but the conservatory question is a very fair question. Thank you. Are you uh, 
Uh, is, is this going to be a joint sponsorship? Or? Yes, uh, I, I believe Representative Torkelson has also put in an amendment, and I'd like to have him co-sponsor this with me. Thank you. Mr. Frost, do you have any? No question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, I think that you've been here next longest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three amendments, and let me start in some ways which, with the amendment I think is the most important. Uh, under current projections, the office, uh, the government printing office in 1995 will lose nearly $29 million, and in 1994, $27 million. Over the last four years, there have been four major studies done on the government printing office, two by the GAO, one by Arthur Anderson, and one by the public printer, GPO 2000. And all of the conclusions are very similar, that GPO is overstaffed for the amount of work that's actually done in-house, that it's more effective to cost, excuse me, more cost effective to contract out work. And finally, the conclusion in all four reports is that GPO personnel must be reduced to decrease losses. In fact, if I can show you, this is a trend line. Uh, since 1984, the green indicates where GPO has made a profit and the red indicate losses. The blue line that you see uh, simply indicates the level of employment at GPO. Now, the Joint Committee on Printing passed a resolution requiring GPO to cut financial losses by the end of 1994. Uh, the JCP also hired a $50,000 consultant to study GPO and make recommendations to reduce losses, but as always, there was a report and nothing was actually done to reduce costs. My amendment would cut the full-time equivalent ceiling of 4,493 positions by 600 to a level of 3,893. That's a 15% reduction, which is equal to approximately $30 million in savings. Now, let me say that my office has had long and protracted discussions with Mr. Fazio, who's indicated that that level itself is not appropriate. In fact, given my choice, we'd be talking about privatizing GPO altogether. But you may hear in the short time a counteroffer of essentially trimming about 300 million slots, excuse me, 300 slots, which is still nearly $15 million in savings. So it's my hope we can put some kind of uh, amendment in place today to allow us to begin making some of the difficult decisions to turn GPO from a money loser into at least a break-even operation. So your uh, feeling is that, that they have too many employees for the work that's being turned out, and that's why you're... Right. If you look at the, the graph... Yeah, and if you see the break in about 1990, two things were happening. More and more work was being sent out of house by government agencies rather than the GPO because GPO printing as a whole is more expensive than work done in the private workplace. And frankly, given the changes in technology, GPO can't keep up with it. And the trend line, I think, also reflects the trend line you'd see in private enterprise, which is more and more work is done uh, in-house as computer technology gets better. And if we don't make corrections soon, the 27 million and then 29 million dollars in losses will be even much worse than that. Is the reason for uh, the price being so high is because of schedule after work around the clock in uh, some of well, these? Well, that's things? one of the arguments to keep GPO in business. Period. But again, private printers, given contracts and constraints, manage to deliver on time. And GPO, as a matter of fact, is overstaffed. And the volume of work is expected to decline in 1995. Um, but we're not doing anything to adjust the staff appropriately. Okay. Mr. Goss? No, I uh, congratulate the gentleman on the direction that his amendments go, um, and I uh, wish him luck in his negotiations. Uh, I think this is a subject that uh, obviously has gotten a lot of attention and deserves attention. I think we've got to make some improvements, and I think your amendments do. Thank you. Mr. Frost, any questions? No Thank you very much. Actually, I have two more. Second one, very briefly. Mr. Lancaster spoke to you already, and as you know, the way billing works with GPO is the government essentially has an account which they can charge against. Uh, at the present time, the appropriations budget, which Mr. Lancaster has already testified uh, in front of you about, will increase that fund another $4.4 million. And Mr. Lancaster and I have an amendment to simply roll that charge back to where it is. In fact, we didn't even reach the threshold we were at last time. And with work decreasing, there's no reason to raise that ceiling even higher. Uh, and uh, I think Mr. Fazio is supportive of this amendment as well. Um, the final one, which you heard testimony about Mr. Roberts briefly, uh, and I won't prolong what I suspect is a futile chase here, uh, would uh, prohibit funding of LSOs and legislative service organizations except for the Democratic Study Group and the Republican Study Committee. 
Uh, we've spent uh, about $35 million over the last 10 years on LSOs. Uh, a GAO study, for example, found that 22% of the tax funds given the LSOs are not appropriately accounted for. LSOs can and continue to spend government money on entertainment, travel, and expensive gifts, none of which I think are appropriate. And uh, there has always been a very dubious relationship, it seems to me, between legislative study organizations and many special interest organizations, which also contribute money to help to support them. And I think we find ourselves in this strange situation where we have 28 LSOs to which members of Congress belong, and then in turn the LSOs turn around and lobby members of Congress on various issues. And uh, finally, I guess the most important point from my perspective would be that there are more than 100 other private groups which uh, essentially serve the same function as LSOs without any kind of special status or without any direct taxpayer funding. Any questions? Mr. Uh, Frost. Uh, Mr. Klug, on that uh, point, the House administration, of course, has been looking at this issue uh, uh, for some time and uh, has been trying to uh, make some reforms in the way that LSOs operate. Uh, I'm concerned that you paint with too broad a brush. Uh, I'm a member of the Congressional Sunbelt Caucus. I find that to be very helpful in terms of providing information about my region of the country. I know there's a Northeast-Midwest uh, coalition that uh, I don't always agree with, but I think is pretty effective in terms of what they do. Uh, I'm an associate member of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus and the uh, Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I have a substantial number of, of black uh, constituents as well as Hispanic constituents in my district. And uh, I think you may paint with too broad a brush in what you're trying to do. Well, th that may be true, and I, I think what we may need to do is tighten up the regulations in the way that LSOs have been allowed to exist. But again, I don't think uh, LSOs are the only way for you to uh, um, lobby and to study issues affecting the black or Hispanic communities or the arts community or um, the Northeast Midwest Coalition, whatever the case might be. My office in particular has chosen not to join any LSOs because we don't think it's an appropriate way to spend money. But uh, I think this is a debate worth having on the floor if you'd give us that but, opportunity. But you, your approach would prohibit any member from making that decision for himself or herself rather than just making it on an individualized basis. Mr. Goss? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think the LSO question is very legitimate. It certainly should be debated, uh, no matter which side of it you're on. And that's what I think Mr. Klug is trying to accomplish here, and I support him in that. Um, my concern is uh, that, you know, we've sort of not gotten the type of uh, horsepower behind the uh, Joint Committee on Reform, uh, suggestions and all the testimony that went in. And I don't know why leadership has not allowed those uh, recommendations to come forward for action by the, the full House, but uh, that's uh, at a different pay scale. Um, the, the point that I would make to uh, my friend Mr. Frost from Texas, I, I agree with him that a member should be free to associate in caucuses or uh, interest groups or of their choosing. The issue here is not their freedom to associate. The interest here is the taxpayers' dollars to support staff, and that's a very different issue. And I think that's what Mr. Klug is getting at: is it an appropriate use of taxpayers' dollars, or is it a subterfuge, subterfuge to have additional staff uh, to get over the caps and limits that we say we put on our staff uh, here on the Hill? Uh, you know, if you add up the total accountability, which is, I think, what Mr. Klug is trying to get to, you get a different number than the official accountability. And, and I think that's a fair debate. It's a question of honesty. Uh, in government. Mr. Goss, I'm, I really don't know uh, uh, where you're drawing your information from uh, because most members don't place staff on any of these caucuses. I've never had a, a staff member work for any of these caucuses. Uh, gentlemen, we all, I was only suggesting that members, as you yourself indicated you do, profit from these LSOs uh, and the staff contributions that are used in support of the LSOs. I would suggest that my constituents profit from that. My constituents profit from the information generated by the Sunbelt Caucus on some very important regional issues that affect Texas and surrounding states. I would agree, Florida. I would include in that. The point of it is, uh, if we are going to have public tax dollars used, why don't we have them used in an open manner and, and in a fair debate and say, these are employees rather than these are extra staff that are over here on an LSO and they don't really count, but we're still paying them. And I think Mr. Klug is trying to focus on that argument. Mr. Thank Klug. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, your input on all three of these amendments. And Thank I you hope very much uh, on both the GPO will have an opportunity to cut. Thank you. The Honorable Peter Bloot. Mr. Chairman, can I ask that the Honorable Mike Castle join me here? Sure. A similar. Uh... <coughs> uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the committee. Uh, my amendment seeks to cut the amount that Congress spends on franking and thus reduce the legislative appropriations budget by implementing four common sense reforms. First, the amendment cuts the official mail allowance for each member in half. Second, it mandates that unspent franking funds be returned from each member's account directly to the Treasury for def deficit reduction. And third, it prohibits unsolicited frank mailings within 60 days of an election. And fourth, it bans the transfer of funds from members' clerk hire and office, office expense accounts to their franking accounts. These are long overdue reforms, and given the current shortfalls in the legislative budget, reducing the amount we spend on franking would be one of the most prudent ways to save money, in my view. I estimate that had the provisions of this amendment been in effect for 1993, the Congress would have saved at least $7.5 million at no great inconvenience to members. And this savings would rise dramatically to as much as $15 million in election years. A majority of Congress, 248 members, spent under 50% of their allowance last year. If they can show restraint, why shouldn't the remaining members do the same? Cutting and restricting franking is an idea whose time has come. There have been over 30 bills dealing with reform of the frank filed during this session of Congress. These bills acknowledge the sentiment of all of our constituents that there is no longer a need for excessive franking. The fax machine, computer, improved and expanded news coverage, and the advent of cable television make it easy for us to educate constituents about what we're doing in Washington without wasting their hard-earned tax dollars on junk mail. <clears throat> By allowing our amendment, Congress would be given the ability to acknowledge our budget difficulties, public sentiment, and common sense by getting the opportunity to vote up or down for franking reform during floor consideration of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. I ask that the amendment be approved by the committee, and I'd also like to register my support for the Boehner Amendment and the Castle Amendment. Mr. Castle. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I would first like to congratulate Congressman Blue for his tremendous work on dealing with this franking issue. I, I am, could not be a stronger believer in constituent communications, uh, and I think that uh, I probably tie for that with 434 other members of Congress. Um, and I try to do it in every way I can. Uh, I go to meetings, uh, I do the things that you do, that all of us do here. Um, I take my phone calls, I make sure that my staff is responsive. Uh, but we decided early on, when I came to Congress last year, that we were uh, going to deal with this franking privilege uh, by setting an example. And essentially we uh, decided not to take calendars and mail them out, not to send out questionnaires, not to send out newsletters to respond to our mail, and, and we're proud that we we've responded to all of our mail. I'm afraid to say that for fear somebody's going to say they never answered my letter. But we try to respond uh, to all of our mail. Uh, even when we have town meetings, we do it around organized groups and do it by posting and hustling around and trying to get people there. And last year, I spent less than any other member uh, in the House on, on franking, which was in the range of five or $6,000 or something of that nature. Uh, and, and yet, I feel we communicated as well as anybody. I absolutely believe that we can do everything that Congressman Blue has laid out here. In fact, I have legislation that even goes farther than that, which I don't think, which I decided not to bring up here, uh, because this is something I think was, is within the realm of possibility and one that we should support. I would just ask that the committee consider it for the purpose of uh, debate. Uh, I think that's what this committee is all about. I believe this is a, a piece of legislation, the, the time for which has come, uh, and if we're given the opportunity to debate it on the floor, that we will uh, adopt this or something similar to it. I think you have uh, other amendments in this particular area, but this happens to be stronger than a lot of them, uh, and for, from my point of view, the, the best of them. And I think this is one of the issues that the public is saying, enough is enough. And I wonder how much they look forward to getting those pieces of mail with our, uh, our signatures on them as opposed to a, a real letter from a real friend or whatever it may be. Um, I think this would, would in the long term, uh, help the image of Congress uh, as, as well as uh, uh, reduce some expenditures. We're not going to balance the budget this way, but people want us to live within our means. And I think this helps us live within our means. So I strongly back the legislation of Congressman Blue. Peter, you said you'd want the Congress to cut the franc in half. Did I? D does that mean the uh, the entire uh, package, or each member cut in half of what he's spending on the franc? That would be the uh, uh, entire package cut in half. Okay. Now you say 50% of the people already. Do yes, last year, 50% uh, of uh, the members of Congress spent less than uh, half of their allotment. 
What is the allotment anyway for the Frank? I think it varies from uh, uh, member to member depending on district as a formula. In my case, uh, it was uh, almost uh, uh, close to two hundred thousand dollars. I think there's a formula, which a is formula uh, three. Based, I think it's three first-class mailings to each household in your district by census, 1990 census, and it varies probably in amounts between 130 or 40, up to close to 200 thousand dollars. I think something in that range. I don't have those numbers exactly. Well, I never come close to it, so I never have to look at what it is. <laughs> oh. I'm probably a little lazier, Mr. Frost. I would ask uh, Mr. Blute, uh, Mr. Fazio testified earlier today, and Mr. Fazio talked about the three accounts that members have. Members have three different types of expense accounts. Uh, he talked about clerk hire in his bill go being raised by $15 million as compared with last year. And with ex allowances and expense, expenses uh, being increased by $24 million as compared with last year. And that the franc uh, being cut by $5 million as compared with last year in his bill. Now, are you uh, asking for cuts in the two accounts that have been increased, clerk hire and expenses and allowances, or are you only asking for a cut in the one that's already been Well, cut? my amendment refers specifically to the Frank account, but I would certainly support other efforts, and I believe there are other efforts in front of the committee. Yeah. There, there are no other efforts in front of this committee to cut those two accounts. Well, I the would only, the only amendments before us... There are some across the board, across the board cuts which would apply to everything in the bill, not just yeah. members' accounts. But there are no specific amendments dealing with well, the two accounts uh, that uh, the committee proposes to increase. Well, I would certainly support uh, keeping those at the same level or uh, supporting reductions of those. Mm -hmm. uh, this amendment deals specifically with the frame. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the committee has already proposed cutting by 10%. Okay, thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What happens to the... Chairman Moakley and myself, when we spend just a few thousand dollars on there, and, and the account that you want to cut in half, I, what think, happens to those I think we're the lowest spenders in the Congress. Do we still cut that? Picture? No, you, you would be your your overall allowance would be cut, not the amount you spent in the past. Let's say you spent ten thousand uh, dollars last year, which you may have. Uh, that would not be cut to 5000 but your, if your allowance was 150 that would be cut to 75000 So you would still be well within the bounds of the uh, amount of money that uh, would be attributed to your account, and that would revert each year to reduce the deficit in accordance with Congressman Blue's Well, what do we do with it? You can transfer it to uh, Clark Hyatt. No, you can't, you can't transfer it out. No, you can transfer well, in, you but transfer you can't transfer out of the franking privilege. And this, your and legislation is a prevent that. call for reduction of the deficit. Well, you know, uh, if so many drips of water hit the ocean, it makes a movement. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I think these are fascinating. You, you're hitting, of course, in an area where we've been talking uh, and taking a lot of testimony today. But the, uh, and I want to congratulate the gentleman from Delaware. I know Delaware is one of the least large states, but that is a very impressive uh, franking record. Uh, we've tried to emulate that and not come as close as uh, you have in your the, success. And the what gentleman would process. yield. It, it is perhaps easier when you're the only congressman from your state and when uh, the, you would be the only one that the media in your state would be covering. Delaware only has one congressman. I, I, will, uh, I will concede that. I think Chairman is correct. It's the reason I'm not asking to reduce it by 90%. Right. Also, it's the third most populous congressional district in the country, I might add, too, even though it's a small state. So the Delaware News Journal, he's the only one they cover. Well, I, I think that the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the gentleman, the, the chairman from, uh, chairman makes a great point, but we all know that the distinguished former governor and current honorable <laughs> member from Delaware uh, is an extraordinary uh, representative uh, and a great public servant. But more than that, being in that particular lightning rod position, uh, I guess you could make the argument that he needs more franking than anybody else to correct the misimpression and the inaccurate media that sometimes we are subjected to. I would never so, say that. I would never say that either. Uh, to get back to the point. You would be wrong. <laughs> to get back to the point. Um, I think that the uh, point here that's been opened up is the abuse uh, at election time. Uh, we, we uh, mince our words, we tap dance around this subject, uh, we don't want to deal with it directly. Uh, I know how many
people feel the same way I do when I read those roll call uh, articles and see the pictures in the boxes of the close elections and the people both sides of the <laughs> aisle who abuse the franking privilege. There is no doubt about it. It happens. It's a fact. You can't deny it, and it needs to be stopped. And when you start looking at the numbers, uh, what you are calling for comes, I think, to a very fair allowance and still helps a way to stop that type of abuse. Uh, I know a number of people have testified in different ways, uh, and I think this will allow people who are using the franc properly to very, very generously go about their business and correspond, uh, and will be an aid into stopping that abuse as well as saving some money. So I congratulate you, and I hope we can make you an order. Well, if I could just uh, comment on that, that definitely there is a spike up in expenditures on franking during election years. And I think that makes our point that uh, some, at some point these expenditures can be used for political reasons rather than just informational. And this amendment, I believe, would go a long way towards uh, rectifying that. Mr. Solomon, do you have any questions? Having arrived late, I know what it's all about, and we support you 100%. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, I believe our next witness is Karen Thurman from the... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had another... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Kessler, did you have something to testify Because we're all involved with that. And, and so is uh, Congressman Quinn, who has a statement in support. I ask unanimous consent, although he's here and may wish to speak to it, to submit his statement. Without objection. Is Quinn going to come up? Well, he may be speaking on something else. Are you, He's here, I think, to speak on something else. Th this amendment is, is also pretty simple. Uh, th there's a lot of different ways to go after this, this problem with the, the, the franc, which I view as a problem, and, and I hope that uh, the members of the Rules Committee would as well, when it's misused, that is. Um, and one of the, the, the areas that I think is, is, is really in the area of abuse is the transfer of $25,000 from the clerk hire and official expense accounts into the official mail account. You can't transfer out from it, but you can't tran you can transfer into it. In 1993, 11 members transferred a total of $177,746.46 into their frank mail accounts. That means that they spent 100% of their frank mail account, which we were trying to cut in Mr. Blute's amendment, and then they spent $177,000 in addition to that. Um, it just seems to me that the, the frank goes far enough as it is. It is a very very generous allowance, I think far too generous. And to allow this transfer, I think it's just a step too far. It's been shown uh, pretty clearly in, in past studies that when transfers are made, it's usually, and I'm not saying in this particular instance, but it's usually in cases in which people are involved in primaries and elections and before the deadlines, they get their mail out uh, and they take full advantage of that. It seems to me that this would be a very simple step if we did nothing else. Uh, we are cutting the, the amount anyhow this year in accordance with Mr. Fazio's original recommendation. And I think combined with this, that we're taking two good steps. I would like to go even farther if we could, but at least this, I think, would be a good rational step to help us start to balance the problem of the, of the frank uh, privilege. Okay. Uh, and were you testifying uh, in furtherance on the Blute Amendment, or were you directly No, sir. That was my own separate amendment, which should be on the I, list. I don't find that on the list. I think Mr. Solomon and I were both looking I'm for it. I'm looking for it. Number two, Mr. Chairman. No, that transfers it from the office account to, to, uh, to the official mail account. You said from clerk hire. Which is it? Well, I'm sorry. What did you say? There are two else? different accounts. There's a clerk hire account and an office account. Yeah, well, you, your amendment is I think it's it a, as a transfer from the office I think account. it's actually allowed from uh, either one. I'm not sure about that. Into the frank account. I'm not sure so which of it's only one, but may maybe either be, one. may not be accurate. So the amendment may not be stated accurately, sure. accurately in its title. Could I ask a question? Then? Sure, please, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mike, uh, I understand what you're getting out, and I support uh, uh, your effort uh, to keep the funds from going into the office official mail account, because I do think it can be abused. I just want to make sure that you are not preventing, though, the, the, the $25,000 from going from clerk hire into the office account. No, you know, I, there are those of us that represent an area much bigger than I, Delaware. <laughs> 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 and I have five district offices, and it is very, very expensive. And consequently, we work with fewer personnel in order to maintain those over a 270-mile link. Uh, and I just, you're not trying to no, do that. I mean, you just want to keep it from going no, into office. My now. intent and the intent of the three of us who have been behind this is simply, and I hope it's stated correctly, even mm -hmm. if that title is wrong in, in okay. the amendment we introduced, uh, is simply to prevent the transfer into the Frank account, not between the other accounts. Great amendment. Supported 100%. Okay, any other questions? Not. thank you very much. Both thank of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No, we have some, he, he'll have his opportunity. Yeah.
The uh, next witness is the gentlelady from Florida, uh, Karen Thurman. Mr. Quinn will be, will be testifying after she does. Ms. Thurman, please uh, proceed. Mr. Chairman, I thank you all. This amendment that we're offering um, is to reduce or is in the area of salary officers and employees appropriations by about $2.9 million. Um, these funds were intended for equipment and software purchases for various administrative offices of the House. However, if you look at the uh, Appropriations Legislative Subcommittee in its report, they stated that, yes, while the equipment purchases and upgrades to existing systems are sometimes necessary, however, it is essential that appropriate review be made of the justification of potential costs and savings associated with these acquisitions and their appropriate author authorization be acquired. The Director of Non-Legislative and Financial Services as de facto Budget officer assured in the future that review and authorization of equipment items is, is given prior to including these items in budget request, basically saying that they had not given the, the best evidence that this was necessary. So what we're asking is that this 2.9 um, actually be cut from this area. Okay. Um, do you have any further testimony on this point? Yeah, I just, and I'll right. leave it with you. Uh, Mr. Solomon. Ms. Thurman, you uh, certainly are entitled to offer your amendment. Uh, we hope we can make it in order, and uh, I think you would win it on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I appreciate that. Mr. Quillen? Well, uh, well, I thank you. And um, patience also is an education in this committee, and I've learned a lot just sitting here listening. So actually, I kind of appreciate this time. Okay. Mr. Goss? Karen, thank you very much. A good amendment. Did you uh, have a chance to run any of this by the committee before? Mr. Goss, yes, I did. I have talked to both the House Administrations Committee and I also talked to the Legislative Appropriations, and I think they both agree with it. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mr. Derrick, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the next witness is uh, Jack Quinn. Pleased to uh, have Mr. Quinn testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to revisit for a minute, probably briefly, the uh, frank discussion. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of an amendment that I'd like to offer, along with my colleague from North Dakota, Mr. Pomeroy, to H.R. 4454. Um, each year, Mr. Chairman, the Congress spends lots of money. We've talked about this when Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle were just here on the frank. Communications, of course, is, is most important with our constituents, and um, this amendment is simple and straightforward, not quite as complicated or as in detail as Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle. <laughs> My amendment simply strikes $4 million from the official mail account, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, the history, as we know it, in 1993, <laughs> the House spent $24 million on frank mail. For 1994, the current estimate is about $41.5 million. The Committee on Appropriations has recommended $35 million for 1995. This amendment would reduce it to $31 million, uh, straightforward. Um, I think that this is a step, modest step in the right direction. I believe that other members will and should support it. And it's an opportunity, I think, for the American people to see that we can cut spending in our own operations, in our own house, while we pursue other areas. It's an opportunity to lead by example. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to appear and to, uh, without objection, give you the written testimony. I, if I may, just briefly, in reaction to Mr. Blute and Mr. Castle, because we've talked about this for the past year, many of us have, and there are many bills present. Um, I think, Mr. Frost, as you said earlier, when I was here uh, listening and being educated, uh, and the discussion was with the LSOs, that you as a member or any member still has the freedom to decide whether to participate or not to participate. And I think that my view, while I personally, um, for example, only spend half the franc, we only do one newsletter, we don't do any unsolicited mail six months before an election, which was a month ago, I have chosen to do that myself. And I think members, depending on where they're from and what their district is like, will choose to do whatever they think is right. That's the way it ought to be, I think, for a start. This $4 million cut is uh, a step in the right direction. And while I will do other things personally as a member and uh, don't want to be critical of Mr. Blute or Mr. Castle, I think it's a, it's a first step to, get, to begin in this appropriations bill. Well, I would only, again, Mr. Quinn, ask you the same question that I asked uh, 
the others, uh, the committee has recommended uh, increasing the other two accounts that affect members, uh, clerk hire and official expenses. The committee has already recommended a cut in the franc. Now, are you suggesting or, or would you favor cutting the uh, two accounts that have been increased for members also, the clerk hire and the official allowances? This amendment only talks to the... Well, I understand, but I mean, are, are, do you think we ought to be cutting those other accounts well, too since they've been increased? Well, I... I Again, I think individually members need to look at what they need. We, Mr. Uh, Solomon has just pointed out that his district is much different than a district like Mike Castle's, for example, and mine is different than somebody else's. And I think we need to make those decisions themselves. Today, no, I'm not prepared to suggest any further cuts. Okay. Mr. Solomon? Well, Jack, I just wanted to commend you ever since you came here uh, a little less than two years ago. You've been a very valuable member uh, with some great ideas. And, of course, this one is fiscally responsible. and. Uh, we hope we can make the amendment in order. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. Mr. Derrick? I have no question. Uh, Mr. Quillen? Chairman, I have no question. Thank you. Jack you did a good job. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mr. Goss? Thank you, Jack. Uh, if, uh, if I told you that the increases that were going into the um, office allowance or the clerk hire could be funneled into the, um, the mail account, uh, what would you say? Well, that, that I think would upset everybody, and I think that that's what we don't want to see happen. I think my interest here today is to make this as uncomplicated as we can and, and hope that we'll see it made in order and get a vote on this as a start. Well, I think Chairman Frost has made a very good point that we're getting a recommendation from the committee that raises up uh, some monies which uh, become fungible, as it turns out, uh, going into the mail account, but you can't take monies out of the mail account and make it fungible the other way. So it's a one-way fungibility, uh, and it's a little bit deceptive. And I think the Chairman Frost is right to point it out to us. Sure. Yes. And as a, as a freshman member of the House and not a member of this committee, I'll leave this to the committee members. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you, for your Chairman. testimony. Uh, the next witness is uh, Bernie Sanders, our colleague from the state of Vermont. Of Vermont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this amendment uh, is being brought forth uh, as a result of the expenditures associated recently uh, with the death and the burial of uh, President Nixon. And in my state, uh, I received uh, some mail on the issue where people were amazed at the amount of government money that ended up being spent, not just for Mr. Nixon, of course, but for any president. And that's what we deal with in this amendment. It's a simple and straightforward amendment that provides that in the event of the death of a former president of the United States, the day of mourning for the legislative branch shall be observed on a Saturday or a Sunday. And the purpose of this amendment is to ensure that such days of mourning are observed as is fitting and appropriate, but that they do not result in additional costs to the federal budget. The leaders of the Congress were right to designate a day for us to honor the public service and accomplishments a former President Nixon when he died last month. And of course, that's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's true of any president. But in my view, it was not right to declare it a de facto federal holiday for all legislative employees. In other words, we closed down the government. And in addition to that, of course, the post offices were closed. And I am not quite sure what the total cost of the government was. My local paper estimated that it was $300 million. In other words, we brought down the entire government at a time of a $4 trillion national debt, at a time when children in America are hungry, at a time we don't have the opportunity to take care of the homeless, we spend some $300 million in order to honor and bury the president. And my own guess would be that our living former presidents right now, as well as Mr. Nixon, probably would have objected to that huge amount of money. We can honor former presidents. They must be honored. They must be respected. But in a time of fiscal crisis, I don't believe it is necessary to spend up to $300 million for that purpose. I, I would suspect that if you had them here today, they might very well uh, agree with us. Um, obviously, we are not here legislating today uh, for the post office, for other branches of government, just for our own uh, expenditures. Uh, the estimate, I believe, uh, the best estimate that I have heard is that f closing down the federal bureaucracy in Washington cost about $60 million. But my hope is that by approving this amendment and getting this amendment passed, and we are also sending a letter to the President of the United States on this, we can start the ball rolling, which says, let us not close down government in order to honor a uh, deceased president. So it's uh, 
fiscally conservative amendment, and I know my friend from New York State and other Republicans will be excited about saving the government some money, so we would look uh, and support from all members of the committee. <coughs> if I understand correctly what you're suggesting, Mr. Sanders, it would be, have the effect <coughs> that in many instances the National Day of Mourning would not be on the day of the funeral of that particular That's person, right. but would be the next weekend uh, right. after the person's death. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Solomon? Since the gentleman mentioned my name and my state. As a neighbor, Mr. Solomon, as a neighbor. <laughs> my district is almost the identical shape of, uh, of his, uh, his state uh, and runs parallel to it. Uh, you know, there are three words that describe uh, Americanism. And those three words, to me anyway, and to my family, are pride and patriotism and compassion. And, you know, I just question whether or not uh, your newspaper was anywhere near correct when they say it costs $300 million. Let me finish first. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you have a snowstorm and there is a close down of a school, uh, there's a snow day there. Right. And discounting whether they have school aid, which they have to make up or something, uh, it does not create an additional cost to the school district. They paid the salary, sure, of the teachers and the administrators. Um, but there was not an additional cost. I, I really question whether there was a $60 million cost to the federal government within the Beltway here or a $300 million cost nationwide. Uh, if the, um, it was the post office actually shut down? I, don't, I didn't rec yes, it recall was. that. But uh, even if it were, uh, I don't think it created that kind of an additional cost. I think that uh, if, uh, if you have anyone who's been a president of the United States, you know, I think we have to show compassion to them, to him and their family. And I, 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 just, I, I just have to beg to differ with you on your, on your amendment. Jerry, if I might. Um, I, I know it's, it's offered in good intention. No, it is. And, and let me just pick up on a point that you made. During the ice storms last winter, the, <clears throat> the Office of Personnel Management estimated that it cost approximately $60 million per day to close down the federal bureaucracy in Washington. That's where we got that figure. In a 1982 study by the House Post Office and Civil Service Subcommittee on Human Resources put the cost of a one-day closing off ordered by President Reagan during a budget crisis between 82 and 86 million. That's just for the bureaucracy here. So I think those numbers are probably accurate. And when you're closing down the United States Post Office, now again, the issue is not lack of compassion, it's certainly not a partisan issue. The question is you have children who are hungry, you have people who are sleeping out on the street. Can we honor a deceased president Mm -hmm. respectfully and with dignity, as I think we must, mm -hmm. without closing down the entire government and spending what I believe is hundreds of millions of dollars. That's the issue. Your, your, your point is well taken. Appreciate you coming for us. Uh, Mr. No, Mr. Oh, Mr. Derrick, I just want to say that I commend you for your amendment, and uh, I don't see why they can't have the funeral on the same day as the, uh, the the day of mourning, and that can't be on a weekend. And and, and I agree with you. It's it's no lack of respect. Uh, but I, I think in a, in effect, what it is, it's a respect for the taxpayers right. of the country. Thank you, Mr. Derek. My my point on the funeral was that some religious faiths require a funeral to be held within a certain period of time, and it couldn't be delayed till the weekend. So you would, in fact, uh, in some instances, have. Uh, the National Day of Mourning and the funeral on a different day. Mm -hmm. That, oh, that doesn't mean that his, uh, his right. amendment doesn't have merit. Sir, I understand. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you're not singling out former president. No, no, absolutely not. Of, of course not. No, of course not. No, it, it just it came to mind because of Nixon's recent death, but this would apply, of course, to all presidents. I remember back when uh, the <coughs> man on the moon President Kennedy declared a national holiday and everything was closed. I remember other holidays that didn't involve the former president's death. <coughs> and really, I don't think it costs that much money because they either catch up, they don't have to have any overtime to overcome what they did. And I think it's a matter of principle, a matter of sympathy, and a matter of uh, pride. and. Uh, the system that we have. I'm not being critical to you. You can be critical, it's all right. Well, no, I'm not. Any way we can save money, fine, but I think there are other ways to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be very interested uh, to see the calculations of how it costs $300 million, but even so, that means we made a profit of $700 million because everybody knows that each day the government is in session, we go $1 billion further into debt. So by having a president die, tragically, uh, it, it ends up that we cut the deficit that day uh, somewhat. Uh, and I don't want to quite look at that kind of a passing in those kind of cold statistical numbers, because that's the kind of nonsense you can do uh, with statistical numbers. Well, are you uh, suggesting that the numbers that I've offered are not accurate? No, I'm saying the statistics are not relevant. Well, uh, I would think that several hundred million dollars now, we can argue about what it is, but we have evidence that when you close down Washington, D.C., and the government, you're talking about 60 or 80 million. When you're closing down the entire postal system, you're talking about several hundred million dollars. What I get a little bit upset about is when some of us say, we need money to feed hungry children, people say, oh, there's just no money available. Let's do something about homelessness. No money available. This is not being disrespectful, please understand that, of any president, certainly not partisan. But we're suggesting, if in fact it is true, that we're spending $300 million to honor a deceased president, I think that is, I don't think these presidents would want us to do that. To uh, I'd, I'd like to see what the direct expenditures were, and I seriously doubt they're accurate, and I will be very happy to have you provide me that well, information. Well, if you put it on the floor of the House, I promise you I will do that. The, the, the other side of it is, I, I feel that uh, this is a very personal thing, and, and, and maybe a little bit, you know, patriotic uh, fervor involved here. I remember very well the day that President Kennedy was shot, and I cannot think that the government could have continued to operate that day. In fact, it stopped of its own accord. Uh, and, and what you get into here is you're, you're going to have a double day of mourning. You're going to have that kind of natural reaction of uh, American citizens out there, and then you're going to have another day of observation. So you're going to end up doubling the cost if you follow this. I think we've got a very good system in this country right now of not trying to manage people's behavior on this. And I think that the family needs to be uh, given a whole lot of attention to this, too. Because I think the day of observation and how the funeral is handled, as uh, Chairman uh, Marty Frost, uh, when he was chairman, was saying was, uh, very important. There are different religions. There are different points of view on this. And I'm darned if I want to legislate it. But well, I certainly will defend it. your right to put it on the you floor. You are legislating it. That's the point. We are legislating it night, right now by spending several hundred million dollars in closing down the government. That's called legislation. I, I think it's just simply a question of priorities. And again, once again, please, this is not any disrespect to any president. I think they deserve all the honor that we can bestow upon them. Okay, that's an executive order question, not a legislative well, question. Well, we can do it legislatively, and that will have an impact. Well, I think now on... you're trying to override the president's nope. right to judge this as our commander-in-chief. Well, and that's another issue that I have a quarrel with you on. Well, I, I think we're being a little bit selective. I hear on the floor of the House once in a while some members trying to outthink the president present a different point of view. I believe very strongly in the separation of powers. We have our job, which is legislation and oversight, and the president has his job, which is administration and execution. And we all agree that there is an interplay between the two, and we don't want it to get out of balance. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you. Do you want copies of the... Uh, uh, I think uh, Porter may want a half a dozen copies. I'd, I really would like to see how you got to $300 million. I'm serious about that. Put it on the floor, and we'll document it even better. All right, Let me have one, too, Bernie. Two points well taken. Thank you, my friend. All right. Yeah, thanks. Who's next? Daisy? Daisy? Dave Camp and the Honorable Dick Zimmer. Thank you. Dick, you're on the private list. Nope. <laughs> you're not on any list, but they tell me you want to testify. I appreciate your you're tolerance. You're on the backup list. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a statement I'd like to uh, submit for the record, and I'll paraphrase it and say that in the last two Congresses, I've introduced legislation, and uh, Congressman Zimmer has co-sponsored it, which would allow members of Congress to return any unspent office funds to the U.S. Treasury to be used for deficit reduction. What this would do would allow members of Congress to send a clear message to the American people that we've heard their call for, re for reducing spending and reducing the size of government. 
This legislation now has over 70 co-sponsors, both Democrat and Republican. And we have an opportunity with the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill to adopt this as an amendment. Uh, this uh, amendment will not change current budgeting practices of the congressional offices. This will not require that any congressional office uh, spend less. It would be up to the discretion of each member. And as uh, that information became available, we think would be a great incentive uh, for members to run their offices more efficiently and more competitively. Uh, this would not increase the actual uh, authorization or appropriation level for congressional offices, uh, but would simply uh, allow members who wanted to uh, to reduce any uns to uh, take any unspent funds and send them uh, to the treasury. Uh, I think this would reward frugality and reward uh, doing what every employer across America has had to do in the last few years, which is to make do with less and provide an incentive and also achieve an admirable goal of uh, attempting to get at our deficit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've now, uh, in three years, uh, returned uh, annually more than 100, or not returned, but not spent uh, more than $100,000 a year of, of the allowance uh, to which I've been entitled. Uh, I wish I could have returned it uh, to the Treasury to reduce the deficit. When my constituents learn that the, mo the money that isn't spent actually can be reprogrammed and spent on other priorities, they ask me occasionally, what's the point? I think that this, this amendment would allow us to link our frugality to the bottom line and to the interests of the taxpayers directly and would create an incentive, both personally and politically, for us to be as frugal as possible because we would know that the money that we did not spend would redound to reducing the deficit rather than to go for uh, whatever uh, other uh, reprogrammed uh, priority there is. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that we could be talking about a substantial amount of money that could be saved if every member saved in the vicinity of $100,000. Uh, but whether or not you support across the board cuts whether or not you believe that you or your colleagues should be spending $100,000 less than they're currently entitled. I think that this legislation, this amendment is quite um, appropriate because for those members who do choose not to spend the money, uh, there's a more appropriate use for it, which namely to reduce the deficit. Stark. No, I, I'm just going to simply say that I, in the overall picture, it probably isn't going to amount to much, but it certainly would be a very good thing symbolically. Uh, thank you, Mr. Merritt. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> it's a little more than symbolic. Um, in the 16 years I've been here, I've always tried to return at least 10% of my clerk hire uh, back to the, uh, uh, to the Treasury, I thought, too. And uh, then in recent years, it uh, turned out that we weren't doing that at all. The money was, could simply be reprogrammed. Did the same thing when I uh, made the mistake of returning a pay raise. And I wrote a check for 17 consecutive months <laughs> to uh, back to the Treasury, found out that money was being reprogrammed. And here uh, I had five children. I had four in college at that particular year. <laughs> and you needless, needless to say, I was a You should have with one of them. <laughs> You're right. But uh, it's, a, it's a, a very good amendment. The thing that really has bothered me is that you've been reading in roll call and some of the local publications that uh, the House administration or the leadership is thinking about freezing uh, our clerk hires as we are currently using it as of this minute. Now, I had a chief of staff retire back on January 1st. I think he was making 80 plus thousand dollars. And I wanted to see if I could get along without that position. So I redistributed the responsibilities. And I have operated without an A, without a chief of staff for now for almost six months. And it's been a real hardship. And then all of a sudden, I find out that I'm going to have my clerk hire frozen at about $70,000 below those that are spending at the maximum. Well, needless, you can imagine what, uh, what I said when I found that out. I think that's been discarded. You gentlemen aren't hearing that, I don't believe, anymore. And that if there are cutbacks, as are proposed in this, this bill, um, uh, it's going to be 
uh, fair and even among members, which is the way it should be. Uh, but your amendment is a great amendment. It should have been enacted many months ago or years ago, and uh, we'll try and make it in order for you. I'd love to, yes. Mr. Derrick, uh, I just don't want to let the opportunity go by. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes he who tooteth his horn too, too much, well. mm -hmm. and uh, I would not mention this, although I'm proud of all the many accomplishments of Mr. Solomon, but I've given money back for 20 years, and I have never taken a pay raise until after an election under the Madison Amendment and written checks back to the, uh, uh, to the thing. I just happen not to holler about it all the time. Mm -hmm. I know, I, I know a person in the chamber that uh, told his constituents that if the pay raise went through, he wouldn't take it. And he says, not only did I not get any good press for it, everybody thought I was lying. So, I mean, he said, I didn't get any good out of it. But actually, when you talk about not taking, as we spoke earlier this morning, this committee was one, is probably the only committee that hasn't asked for an increase in uh, 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 payroll. payroll for the last uh, four years. And then when the committee came to cut, they cut us just like everybody else. And, and you know, we thought that should have been a baseline because we just held it down. Our employees didn't get pay raises, didn't get the callers, didn't get what they want because we just held it down. But no uh, good deed goes unpunished. That's right, mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, I know what you're saying, but uh, uh, but maybe if a person uh, just shows it in his own record uh, and takes oath of office that that's true, maybe people will stop believing him. Mr. Goss, I'm sure you've got something to add to this <laughs> great conversation. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, not much, actually. You've said it so well. Um, the, the official mail cost issue is an interesting one. We, we uh, didn't use all our, our franc one year, and I said, I'd like to return that. What do you do with the surplus? And it, I was told there is no surplus. I said, what do you mean there's no surplus? And I was told by House Administration in the most remarkable piece of mail I got in my first year here that said, we don't budget the full amount for the f members' franking. We just pay the bill. Consequently, there is no surplus. Now, it's pretty hard, therefore, to have an incentive to cut the franc back because the theory is, well, they're just going to pay the bill whatever you use or you're not. So there is no savings incentive there at all. So I think that would improve the situation very dramatically. Well, thank, you very much. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your giving us the opportunity to testify today. And, you know, being freshmen, it hardly seems like time has come again that we're here for the second time, but that's the case with this amendment. So, Mr. Torx and I return again to ask that you allow our amendment dealing with franking disclosure. Our amendment is quite simple. It merely expands on the improved franking disclosure practices that were established in the fiscal year 1991 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. Language in that bill directed the United States Postal Service to report all franking expenditures on a monthly basis to the House. These monthly reports provided to each of our offices are kept confidential and are not available to the public. All that is reported to the public is a quarterly, unitemized total of money spent. But where current disclosure practices are most inadequate is in the area of timeliness. The quarterly report of the clerk is usually issued some three months after the close of the reported quarter. In election year, that means that money spent by a member in July, August, and September, just before the election, is not made public until December or January after the election. The alternative to waiting for the quarterly report is to file a Freedom of Information Act that any individual has the right to do, but we believe that the Congress has a responsibility to provide that information itself. The National Taxpayers Union agreed with us last year and endorsed our amendment. In 1990, this Congress wisely created a detailed method for the accounting and reporting of all taxpayer money spent on franked mail. In 1994, we hope that you will give the members a chance to take the next step toward meaningful reform and allow us the opportunity to pass our amendment to make that information readily available to the public. We, just, we don't want to change the procedures, just let the public see that information. How would you allow the public to see this information? 
if they, you know, these reports that we get monthly would be available to the public. If they requested a copy, then it would be available. I, I do that as an individual. I mean, we can now do that. If someone wants mine, I let them see it. I don't send but one mass mailing a year. I returned 72 percent of my franking budget last year. You what? Returned 72 percent of my franking budget last year because we only did, you know, one newsletter. But, you know, anyone that wants to see it should be allowed to, you know, the month report should be public information, and that's all we want to do. It wouldn't change the report. It just says the public doesn't have to go through the long process of a Freedom of Information Act. The public can still get it. You're just requiring them to go through a two- or three-month process. Right. We're saying let them get it quicker. You know, if they want it, we, the Congress, are saying, sure. When you want to see it, you can see it. Peter Tarkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to testify again before your committee, uh, Jerry Solomon and Board Goss. Um, just quickly to, to reiterate what, what Congresswoman Fowler has said, we're not asking for any new paperwork to be created. We're just asking to release the paperwork that's already compiled, uh, that is in existence. We just think it should be available on a monthly basis. Instead of having uh, everyone have to wait for the quarterly reports to come out, usually two quarters after the fact, this would just give people a, a timely uh, uh, basis to find out who is spending how much money, how quickly on franking. So we're, we're just asking to, for a very simple and direct disclosure requirement there. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to speak on two amendments uh, proposed separately from, from Mrs. Fowler, but uh, two that I think are important. Uh, the first one that I, I'd like to, to mention is to reduce the $10.2 million appropriation for the Botanic Garden by $7 million. Your, your co-sponsor is up here. Testified on that earlier. Yeah. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just for the details, uh, given uh, the tight fiscal times we're in, I think we need uh, more information on this. I understand that the, this is a, an estimated cost by the architect of the Capitol. I know there has been some private fundraising uh, being done for this, uh, as there should be, but I think that uh, all members deserve to have a, a little more information on exactly how that is happening. And again, perhaps if we, we can't afford it this year, uh, maybe in some future year, but uh, I think uh, this type of cut is appropriate given the fiscal circumstances right now. The Second Amendment would propose a $3 million cut uh, in the Congressional Printing at the Government uh, Printing Office. I don't know if uh, the co-sponsor on that has testified yet or not. Yes. Okay. Very good. And again, this is uh, what I believe is an attempt to cover up uh, a deficit from previous years uh, um, from uh, executive branch printing requests. I think that, uh, like every other shortfall in funding, that's going to have to be made up. I know it's painful. It's something that we all have to live with, though. And I think a, a $3 million reduction out of the total $6.8 million increase uh, is doable. Again, it won't be easy. There are a lot of, of cuts that are going to be difficult to make, but this is clearly another area where I think the taxpayers have to be told that we're looking out for their interest, that uh, we're looking at, at cutting our own expenses uh, while, while cuts have to be made in many uh, accounts across the board. And so I hope that all three amendments would be made in order. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Peter, first of all, both of your amendments are good amendments, and uh, we hope we can make them in order. Uh, concerning the, um, the publicizing of the, um, of the member's franking, that's nothing but accountability. Uh, we do it with our financial disclosures. That's available to the public. Uh, our payroll is available, you know, through the quarterly uh, clerk hire reports. Uh, certainly, franking should be, too, and I think it's a great amendment. I hope we can make it in order. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Mr. Goss. I presume you're trying to stop election abuse of the franc is the main thrust of this. Is Precisely. that correct? And, and we figure I congratulate you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Thank Chairman. You. The Honorable John Miker and the Honorable Jennifer Dunn. I think okay. it's done with the right back, but if I may start, Mr. Chairman. And I do have a separate amendment to other than what uh, Ms. Dunn is presenting. Uh, today, before the rules committee, uh, we're going to put the mic on. Sorry. Today, before the uh, rules committee, I bring a uh, very serious matter, um, and I think it deserves the attention of the full house and 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 a vote. Mr. Dunn, you want to join Mr. Micro at the table? Are you on the same amendment? No. It, no oh, we okay. Are not. Thank you. Um, I serve on the House Government Operations Committee, and. Uh, it's, it is an interesting committee because it, it historically it dates back to uh, uh, 1814 when it was in the wisdom of the early founders of the Congress and the nation. Uh, the committee was broken off from ways and means and it, it doesn't have a legislative purpose as you may well know. It is in, in charge of investigations and oversight, uh, an extremely important uh, responsibility. Uh, 
I'm not here today to request any additional funds. What, I, what I'm uh, looking for is really uh, a mission to restore confidence in the system. And I, I say that because I think that the very integrity of the House of Representatives is at, at stake, particularly in, in this time uh, and day when you have one party that dominates the executive branch the and both of the legislative branches. Uh, and they control the investigative and oversight uh, committee of, the, of this particular uh, committee of Congress in a very unfair uh, fashion. I also understand that the amendments that I am pr uh, presenting require a waiver of the rules, and I believe that this uh, bill is uh, both the appropriate route because it involves committee funds. And as I said, this is a, a question of real fairness uh, and also integrity of the system. The my majority and minority staff disparities really make a mockery of the entire congressional process of investigations and oversight. And I brought some charts to illustrate, if I may. Can you bring those up, please? This is the number of investigative staff uh, for the majority and for the uh, minority in, in Government Operations Committee. If you, we've had request after request for documents, for assistance from the administration, we've gotten stonewalled. And I won't go into the long list of, of items that are pending. But how can you conduct oversight and investigations of the executive branch when the minority has nine staff? Actually, I think this is up now to 10. And that's only because I've been uh, raising so much cane on this issue from the day I came here. But how can you be fair with investigative staff of that uh, representation. And then funds, yep. members of the uh, committee, funds are, look at how they're distributed here. The minority, no. uh, I'm sorry, staffing uh, is minority. Look at these percent percentages, 14.8% for the uh, major minority and 85.2% for the majority. Then let's look at the funds. The 94 uh, expenditures that are proposed, the Democrats get $2.175 million, 83% of the funds. The Republicans get 17% of the funds, $594,000. Now, I, I say that this is grossly unfair in this circumstances, and my amendment does uh, divide up uh, on the basis of representation in the House, which I think is very fair. The House has voted twice to grant the minority one-third investigative staff uh, or funds, and this has never been met. The Senate has granted the minority at least a third of committee staff since 1977. Then my other amendment deals with the, alter the only alternative I see, and, and uh, I'm hesitant to uh, propose it, but I'm very uh, uh, sincere when I do propose it. The uh, other amendment says abolish the committee. If we can't have some fairness, if we are going to conduct real uh, investigations and real oversight on a fair and equitable basis, then I think we have no alternative to abolish the committee and turn this money back to the taxpayers. So that's the, uh, the proposal that I bring before you today, uh, two alternatives, uh, and I hope that we have an opportunity to debate these on the floor. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I, it's impossible to legis legislate fairness. Um, you can try and do it set by example, but I understand your frustration. Um, the question I want to ask you is, did you testify before the Committee on Reorganization on this? I've testified. Bef uh, my comments are part of their report. I've testified before uh, the Appropriations uh, Committee uh, or House Administration Committee. Uh, I've brought this matter to the floor on repeated occasions. And I'll continue to pursue this matter until there's some fairness and equity. Thank you very much. I have nothing okay. further. I hope we can make it in order. Thank you. Uh, we've only got two minutes left to vote, Porter. Have you voted yet? I have, sir. Oh, I haven't. So uh, I, I wish I could s s squeeze you in in two minutes, but I don't think so. Can I? OK. Uh, thank you. We'll be in recess up to call the chair. You're watching coverage from Wednesday's hearing before the House Rules Committee on appropriations for the legislative branch for fiscal year 1995.
The Rules Committee decides guidelines on how a bill is debated on the House floor and what amendments are introduced. Members are considering a $1.9 billion bill for overall congressional operations, including the Library of Congress. We'll continue with the hearing in just a moment, but first a few program notes. This week on Book Notes, our guest is Pete Hamill, former editor-in-chief of the New York Post. He joins us to discuss his recent book, A Drinking Life. Book Notes can be seen each Sunday on C-SPAN at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and again at 8 Pacific. And later this morning, around 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we plan live coverage of a hearing on deficit reduction held by the Joint Economic Committee. Testifying before the committee, economist James Galbraith. That's later this morning, around 10 o'clock Eastern Time, here on C-SPAN 2. We now return to the second part of this hearing of the House Rules Committee as members work on a legislative branch spending bill for fiscal year 1995. The Rules Committee decides the guidelines on how debate is conducted in the House. Legislative appropriations deal with money to be spent to run the House of Representatives, including members' expense accounts. The chair of the committee is Democrat Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. This part of the program runs about 10 minutes. The Rules Committee will resume, and we're very honored to have the Honorable Jennifer Dunn before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you for letting me come and talk to you today. Regarding the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill, first, I, I would like to take a, a moment to comment on an amendment that was uh, presented here earlier by Congressman Tom Manton, who is the chairman of the subcommittee on which I I am the ranking Republican police and personnel on House administration. His amendment based on H.R. 4227, which he and I introduced, would raise the mandatory retirement age of the Capitol Hill police officers from 50 to 55. Uh, this change makes our retirement age regulation comparable to that governing other federal police officers. And so as ranking member of the Police and Personnel Subcommittee, I strongly urge the members of the Rules Committee to approve that amendment that Mr. Manton presented to you earlier. Mm -hmm. Next, Mr. Chairman, I urge the committee to make in order two amendments that I've been supporting as a member of the House Administration Committee and as a member of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. The First Amendment simply reduces the amount of the funding of the Investigative Committee staff by 4%. Uh, that would take it from $53,191,000 to $51,063,360. The House is currently grappling with a full-time employee reduction requirement, and my amendment would help solve this problem for the House with a minimum of disruption, simply the cutting back of the investigative committee staff. The Joint Committee has also called for a reduction, and so my amendment really pushes us further in the direction set by both the Legislative Branch Subcommittee and the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. Uh, that amendment that I've uh, provided you also includes a minority protection clause that the members of the minority or the ranking minority member would be able to control one-third of the budget of that committee. Mr. Chairman, it's important to note that this is only a 2% reduction of total committee funding for 1995 it would be. My second amendment is a limited version of the one I've just told you about. It simply accepts the funding levels approved begrudgingly and asks that the minority be given a one-third share of the investigative staffing. I would like to see that under their control. Mr. Chairman, in 1989, it was Congressman Coelho, who was then Majority Whip, who pledged to bring minority staff ratios in line with the minority representation in the House of Representatives. That was five years ago. At that time, in 1989, Republicans controlled about 17 percent of the staffing of committees on the investigative side. We have moved at least uh, January 1, 1994, to 21 and a half percent. But under that trend, it would take us until the year 2006 to get to 33 and a third percent control. And so I believe now is the time to alleviate this disparity and uh, t to treat the minority as, as we know you would wish to be treated. Thank you very much, Ms. Dunn. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Congresswoman Dunn, let me just uh, heap praise on you for your tenacity and uh, in, in your persistence, really, in pursuing congressional reform. You are a member of the Congressional Task Force 
uh, appointed by the speaker uh, to try to reform this house and uh, certainly uh, you're following through here again today uh, in that effort uh, the amendments are excellent amendments uh, you certainly should be heard we have to remember that uh, the because of the way that the um, our system is set up there is no authorizing bill in other words we have a an, a legislative appropriation bill but we don't have the opportunity to legislate because there is no authorization bill uh, only that would come out of uh, the committee you serve on the house administration occasionally maybe every five years uh, but on a yearly basis you and i and others don't have a chance to offer legislation such as this so that is why you are entitled to your waivers, uh, and we hope we can make your amendments in order. Thank you so much for Thank your good you, work Mr. you do. Also, Ms. Dunn, I think if you check, if we're not mistaken, I think this committee comes as close to that two-third, one-third as any committee in the Congress. You know? It does, and uh, Joe Moakley has been extremely fair. Uh, uh, not only has he, uh, uh, along with myself, gone before your committee and asked not to have our uh, uh, budget raised, budget raised but uh, uh, he has always treated us almost fairly, uh, very, very, very close. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and you've been held up as a good example, and certainly I think you felt your share of cuts, too, along the way, despite a, an excellent performance. In fact, in the last we, four years, we didn't even ask for an increase. We were the only committee rare. in the Congress. I but know. yet, when it came time for cutting, they didn't use our past history as any barometer. They cut us, no, too. you got more <laughs> than your fair, fair That's share right. of cuts. Thank you very much, Jim. Mr. Thank Goss. You. Thank you. I just have a point of clarification about one of the statements uh, I thought I heard you say, and maybe I got it wrong. Uh, I think when Mr. Mant was before us, he s was talking about the mandatory retirement age capital police officers going from 55 to 57. Did I hear him wrong, or did I hear you wrong, or did I just hear wrong? I, my understanding of the amendment is from age 50 to 55, but I'll double check my numbers. I, I, I think it's an interesting subject to debate, but I'd like to know what the numbers are. You bet. And we'll maybe get my sheet you. is wrong here. We'll get them to you right away. Is, an, is there a national average on uh, police retirees? I know that uh, I think that uh, most policemen do retire at 55, don't they? That's my understanding. No, that was mine, too. So I'm a little puzzled, but we'll get it sorted out. And why we're unusual, but we'll let you know for sure. Uh, on the other question, uh, Jennifer, I happen to agree that, you know, the way you're going on the one-third breakdown is great, but I would rather see it go on a true proportional basis. Uh, you know, the Republicans are not non-people, uh, and if the Democrats were the minority, they would not be non-people. Uh, and i got to think we've got to remember that we've got uh, a representational proportion here that is not in any way reflected. Uh, and one of the debates, one of the problems here we're going to having with this particular piece of legislation is that it is a reflection on management. And the management here is 100 percent controlled by the majority party. And when there is unhappiness, there is defensiveness by the majority party to try and justify what often cannot be justified. And that is part of our problem. Now, I say that present company accepted because I also agree with our ranking member that Chairman Oakley does an extraordinary job of taking the work of this committee and the way this committee operates and handling it fairly when we all very well know that this committee is designed to be the handmaiden of the Speaker's office for the management of flow of legislation. Uh, we understand that. Uh, and there have been a lot of commentary about whether it serves its purpose uh, one way uh, or another. And maybe that should be a study of your committee as well, and I understand it is. But I have no complaints uh, with the way Chairman Oakley runs this business. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Goss. And Thank I would just say that we, too, would like to reach toward the 41 percent that we really represent in, mm. on the floor of the Congress now. And we believe that if we staffed at that level, and that would be a long-term goal because we're nowhere near the one-third that we're asking for now, but there would be a set of staff who could provide us with fresh ways to solve problems. I think that's what we're missing right now. Mm -hmm. So I would urge the chairman and the committee to, to grant that this amendment be debated on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, committee will stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair. Uh, members will be given a uh, uh, half an hour yes. before we... Uh, come back in a session for the uh, voting on the roll. Thank you.
This is coverage from Wednesday's hearing before the House Rules Committee on Legislative Appropriations for Fiscal Year 1995. The Rules Committee decides guidelines on how a bill is debated on the House floor and what amendments are introduced. Members are considering a $1.9 billion bill for congressional operations, including the Library of Congress. We'll continue with the hearing in just a moment, but first, a few program notes. C-SPAN wants to hear your comments about our programming. If you'd like to call us, our number here in Washington is area code 202-626-796.